You're listening to the Secret Muse Society, where we pull out the things we keep hidden about ourselves. What are the secrets that actually hold us back from the connection we crave? And what happens when we tap into the inspiration we have to offer the world? I'm your host, authenticity coach, Karen Choi. Let's dive in together. Can I get a witness? Do you know the song that I'm singing? I, I decided I wasn't going to sing a song, but I can't help but sing a song to welcome you back to the Secret Muse Society. You're listening to episode 35, Enter the Zone of Genius. And actually... The zone of genius isn't creepy or sci-fi. It's actually very real. And my experience of the zone of genius, it is something that we have to kind of go on a treasure hunt for. We have to uncover and let it unfold. And so this is your host, Karen. And today's episode is inspired by a muse. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what inspired this episode, and then we'll dip our toes into the zone of genius. How does that sound? I hope that my energy can stay true and energizing for you. I must admit that I have a cold. (laughs) And so maybe my voice sounds extra soothing, even though I've been hacking along and sipping on lemon and honey tea. I have to admit I'm a pretty big suck when I'm sick. (laughs) All I want to do is lie in bed with five blankets on me and being in the pitch dark and there be no sound. I find everything is louder when I'm sick, I was describing to my brother on the phone today that I kind of feel like I am running through a forest, a mosquito infested forest, and I am only wearing a bikini and I'm wet because I just came out of the water. And I only have one shoe because while I'm running through the mosquito infested forest and being attacked by mosquitoes, One of my shoes fell off and I'm wet. And so everything is kind of sticking to me and the mosquitoes are attacking me and I'm getting like hit by branches and have to make sure I don't trip over a rock. It just feels like a sensory overload. I hope that's not a downer. It's actually kind of a funny image, isn't it? Anyway, I am sipping on some Neo Citroen Night. So who knows what will come up in our chat today. So I was singing, I was singing, Can I Get a Witness? This song has been covered by Marvin Gaye, The Rolling Stones, The Temptations, Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, Can I Get a Witness? And it's really the lyrics of the song aren't in line with what I have to share today, but What I want us to come together is to witness a zone of genius. Like, what is it like when you are in the presence, when you are in the zone of your own genius or someone else's genius? Let's start with someone else's genius because sometimes that's easier to notice. You know that feeling when you're just watching someone do their thing, and it seems effortless and natural, organic, like the level of skill to do what they do, you know, that has been honed and mastered. And they just look like they're having so much fun. (laughs) And the passion behind it You just know that it like means the world to them to be doing it. I'm thinking of some people that I follow on Instagram. For example, the Black Forager. Her name is Alexis. And she 
She's kind of like me, which maybe is why I kind of love her. Or I just love people who break out into song, especially when they are in the forest. And (laughs) she looks for things like acorns and mushrooms. And along these journeys, she teaches you about what knowledge has been passed down to her through her Indigenous and Black roots. And she's just so excited about these little herbs or pokeweed. And then she fills her basket and like kind of dances or skips home. (laughs) And at home, she will cook the stuff that she foraged and show you how to do it. For example, pokeweed. I have it in my garden. I spent a good four hours digging and pulling it all out. And for all I know, I learned from Alexis, the black forager, that when the pokeweed is young in the garden, you can actually dig it up and cook it. You can boil it for 15 minutes and eat it. And it's actually really nutritious and free food. Don't eat it raw, though. It is poisonous. And just like she just kind of takes you on this adventure and getting to know the food and the food all of a sudden becomes has a personality because she has such an incredible personality. And you're just like, wow, you're just in awe and inspired and you want to play with them and you want to hang out with them. I feel like that is being a witness to someone's zone of genius. And maybe we could say, like, what is that zone exactly? Is she, is her zone of genius cooking? Is her zone of genius making videos? Is her zone of genius sharing information about foraging? Is her zone, but it, it's all those things. It's not just one. It is this magical combination. She actually is like this recipe that comes together of foraged things in her life experience. And that's where her genius comes to life. That, to me, is witnessing a zone of genius. So in this episode, I'd like to tell you what inspired us to be here. And then we'll dive a little deeper into your zone of genius and talking about how to find it. Here's the story. It was a Saturday. I had nothing to wear to a 70s themed birthday party that night. In the morning, we drove to Costco to run errands, and near the Costco, there is a Salvation Army thrift store. And I say to my husband, okay, I got to go in there because there's this party tonight. I don't have an outfit, and that's where I'm going to find something. So I had my phone loaded with inspirational photos of my mom, of Yoko Ono, and what I've recently discovered, the Sukeban, which is a girl gang movement in post-war Japan. I will talk about it more. I need to learn more about it first, but let's just hold on to that word, Sukeban. So my mom in the 70s, she was in her 20s. She had shoulder length hair. It was parted in the middle, kind of like Farrah Fawcett, where it was flowing back on those days and curled back, feathered back on those days that she did her hair. I'm kind of referencing a photo of her. I think it was her engagement photo. And she was wearing a white turtleneck and layered on top of the white turtleneck was this black and red flowing dress with a deep low V, wide sleeves, cinched at the waist by a belt that was the exact same fabric as the dress. And the dress was to the ground. She wore a shoe with kind of a chunky heel. And did she wear big chunky glasses? I think so. Also with a necklace, like a long necklace with a pendant around her neck. And then Yoko Ono. Oh, who doesn't love Yoko Ono's fashion vibes. Like, is Yoko Ono a fashion icon? I'm not really sure. But what I loved about her look in the 70s was her long, full, kind of frazzled hair. And she partnered, she walked around with her partner, John Lennon, in like this kind of linen, white, all white outfit. 
flowing, also a low V cut. Those were the, and like long linen, same like monochromatic kind of color, flowing pants to match the flowing shirt with probably like this fur shawl. So it's kind of like 60s, 70s. I guess she was, she had, you know, like hippie disco vibes for me. And then the Sukeban. Oh, the Sukeban are this girl gang movement in post-war Japan, like I mentioned. And these girls were considered defiant and dangerous in 70s Japan. Because Japan, the stereotype is that their women are obedient and modest and courteous. And these Japanese women in the 70s, they were under so much societal pressure to serve as dutiful wives and good daughters and work on their family farms and, you know, singly, single-handedly manage the domestic sphere. All the kinds of things that I'm like, that is not, I mean, that could be part of who I am, but that is not the only thing about me. So with the arrival of World War II, the Japanese woman that's when they first started to challenge the traditional gender roles, which meant that there was like this slow trickle of women making their way into male-dominated industries. And I, I believe that this is true ac- around the world when it came to World War II. The men were fighting, and so the women had to enter the workforce. And so the Japanese culture was shifting, but at the same time, it was resisting so hard the idea of women working outside the homes. And wages were way less than their male counterparts. They continued to have to lack basic rights and including the right to vote. And they were oppressed, these women, during Japan's wartime. So it's no surprise then that like in the 1950s and 60s, Just like around the world, there was like this women's social justice movement and they wanted to, you know, break down those oppressive systems. Oh, my gosh, it's still happening now. But the Sukiban, which translates in from Japan to girl gang, and they were fierce. They wore combat boots They were into organized crime, and their sole purpose was to challenge the traditional sexualization and oppression of women that had historically defined Japanese society. So they were brandishing their katanas, they were tucking razor blades under their skirts, and the sukiban were no longer following the strict hierarchy and moral code. These were rebel girls. They were, they had, they were smoking cigarettes in public and punishing their people with cigarette burns and public beatings. Like they were hardcore. Anyway, so their look, their look is like long black skirts, which back then really contrasted the white garments that the Japanese schoolgirls were wearing. And they carried weapons like razor blades and swords under their long skirts as both self-protection and as a statement that made them feel powerful and fashionable and leading a revolution. This was paired with Converse sneakers. They had long permed hair. They wore dark red neck scarves. They customized their skirts with anarchic messages and... They also had pencil thin eyebrows. Anyway, these sukeban, let's dive into them another time even more, but they are they are a vibe, right? <laughs> okay, so back to they are they were inspiring. So, after an hour of not knowing what the heck I was looking for in the Salvation Army thrift store, I finally left with a leather skirt, which when I got home, I realized was too small. A kimono style jacket, which when I got home, I realized was torn at all kinds of seams. And I didn't notice because my kids were, I was 
in the store with the girls and they were kind of like, mommy, look at this, mommy, look at that. And anyway, that's what shopping was like for me. Kind of like running through the woods, being attacked by mosquitoes, half naked and wet with one shoe. And then I got came home with a colorful neon scarf, which is totally not 70s, but it was soft <laughs> and colorful. And I felt really good about it. So I had nothing to wear. And I texted my friend, Allison, in a pinch. And lucky for me, she said, yes, come. So when I got to Allison's place, I showed her a few photos of mom, Yoko Ono, the sukeban, and then sparks started to fly. Allison, we were in her space where she has all of her vintage and pre-loved clothes. And she was like, whirling around the racks and bins and cupboards and pulling things out and saying, ooh, what about this? Ah, you know what that needs? Or, oh, I have the perfect earrings. And in less than 10 minutes, 10 minutes, I had a beret, a pair of kick-ass boots that were also comfortable. And I was trying on different combos of like long pleated skirts, belts, corduroy vests, Printed polyester tops, scarves, dresses, jumpsuits galore. Like Allison put everything together effortlessly, joyfully. She whipped together an amazing fit, just like that. Several, actually. But the final look that I chose was closest to the vibe that I wanted to express. It was like a little punk, a little mystery and a little chic. So when I was there, I was just like, whoa, this just seems way too easy to be true. And I was saying to Allison, I was like, oh my gosh, this, you're amazing. And she's like, nah, it's no big deal. I love this stuff. That's how she says it. She's got the greatest smile. Being in Allison's presence in this moment, in this place of picking out a 70s outfit from her collection of clothing, I was in awe. And I could feel her energy and her enthusiasm, and I was energized by it all. Like, I felt charged. And I was just there fully, fully appreciating her genius. Her genius, my friends. Yes. Her genius. That's like what I was saying about that being a witness, being noticing what that's like when you're noticing someone else's genius. So Allison is the muse of today's episode. The genius is the muse of this episode. And don't tell me you're not a genius. We'll get into that. Don't tell me you don't have genius. Everyone has it. We'll get into that. But how about we start with what genius is not? All right. I no longer subscribe to a definition of genius that separates us and sorts us into categories, right? Like when you think about genius, what are you thinking? Above average? Oh, but what if you're at average? Or what if you are below average? And what the heck are we scoring exactly? These groups feed like this really messed up system, right, of inequity. Because its only goal is to filter. I think that its only goal is to filter for profitability. Patriarchy and capitalism. So, for example, standardized tests and scores are used to find the top 1%. Except this only acknowledges 1% of what people are actually capable of. And while I appreciate intelligence, I think smart is an old paradigm that is narrow and limiting. If we only look at, look at people for what, they're, what makes them smart, what makes them profitable, what makes them, if the mind is the only thing that is of value to us, then what kind of world? Well, hey, that, that might be the kind of world we're in now. But I invite you to think like, what does our world look like when we center creativity, inner resourcefulness, And when we embrace wholeness, to me, that's so much smarter. (laughs) And I think I'm pretty smart (laughs) outside of intellectual ability. To me, genius lives beyond our limits of intellectual ability. 
Genius is a spiritual gift. Yes, every human is born with genius, including those with low IQs or with disabilities, because you hear me emphasizing the word with I see it as genius and in a world of buts. <laughs> I said buts. <laughs> we have inherent value, right? I know you believe that. But the thing is, are we living it? We each have something to contribute just by existing. Everything else is bonus. And I think about this often because it's a thing that I have to remind myself of constantly. When I notice that I start valuing productivity over my inherent value, when I start attaching my worth to what I make, you know what I'm talking about? Especially when my own ambition gets the best of me. Here are some of those thoughts. A title that shows I'm in charge and I know what I'm doing. People listen to me or accolades that say, you should believe in me because those important people believe in me. Or what about rave reviews that prove, oh, wow, she's special. She's changing lives. How about a fat bank account to show that your hard work is worth a lot of money. You're in demand. You are needed. Things like likes, followers, media appearances, bragging rights. They sound like, look at all the stuff I did. Look at how productive I am. Look at why I'm worthy of your attention. I've made a name for myself. I've proven my existence is acceptable and accepted. Hey, like, I'm talking to you through a podcast right now. I'm saying, hey, listen to me. By the way, I am really grateful for your time and for you being here. And I'm not saying that any of the things I just listed are bad. They're thoughts and feelings that I no longer shame myself for having. Because I now can realize where they are and where I am. I see them for what they are. It's a human experience. And I hope you can see that too. I have a feeling that you're working on it too. Your inherent value. Sometimes striving to achieve is like running down a hill. Your feet can only go so fast until the body takes over. And then gravity reminds you to be humble. Just Google running down a hill fail. <laughs> For me, gravity gravity. I'm just looking at, I just pictured John Mayer's kind of screw face when he sings gravity, but it's such a good song. For me, gravity is remembering the sheep farmer in rural China. Gravity is the indigenous child in Canadian foster care. Gravity is seeing that young adult in the wheelchair and the caretaker who's feeding him. Gravity is acknowledging the mother in Iran fighting for her daughter's freedom. And gravity is even the starving polar bear looking for ice and food. Gravity asks, what's their name? They don't have what you think you need. What about their value? And what does that say about yours? Gravity always brings me back to humility. Yes, yes. Their existence is important and meaningful because they are important and meaningful. And so are you. And so am I. So what is genius then? Back to the genius that we each have. Full disclosure, I don't know if Allison sees styling as part of her genius. I will find out after this podcast goes out. <laughs> It's what I see in her based on what I know genius to be. Genius is where talent, skill, joy, and values come together. With Allison as our muse, let's go through talent, skills, joy, and values. Talent, we ask, what comes naturally and easily to her? What I see is that Allison sees a person's beauty, their body shape, their skin tone, their charisma. 
And from that, she picks out clothing and accessories that complement their qualities. Skills. What does Allison do better than most other people? I think she spots quality in fabric, construction, and shape. From this, she can interpret a fashion idea into reality. That takes skill and joy. What gets Allison excited like a kid in a candy store? I've seen it. She loves treasure hunting at thrift stores, estate sales, and flea markets. She loves when she finds gold. For example, when I was trying on all these outfits, there was this jumpsuit, this one piece thing that to me, if I saw it on a rack, it would look like a curtain. And when I held it up, she's like, you got to try this on. When I held it up, I was like, nah, that's not going to fit me. It's like a balloon shape. That is not going to be flattering. Boy, was I wrong. I put it on and it looked amazing. (laughs) Like this piece of clothing was such good quality, a vintage piece. You would never think looking at it hanging would be something that would be attractive or stylish, but oh my gosh. And then she like passed me belts to pair with it. I would never think of matching these types of things together. Do you see where her talent of seeing my body and that jumpsuit or her skill of seeing that jumpsuit and its potential and its quality and the fabric and the shape of it. And just that joy of her, the joy she has of finding something. And she like, she gets giddy. She's like, hey, 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 right. It's amazing. And, and now values. The fourth part of the genius is what matters to Allison. When it comes to Allison's business, And in her personal life, the planet. She is really passionate about keeping stuff out of landfills. And so one of Allison's goal in her business is to run an eco-friendly business where she uses recycled items whenever possible. And she advocates for buying pre-loved and vintage clothing because the clothing business actually is one of the worst. It's, it's, it's the thing piling up in our landfill. I don't have the, I don't have the data at the tip of my tongue right now, but Allison would. Like if you were talking to Allison, she would tell you all the specs of how clothing in landfills, clothing getting shipped to Africa, how it's just a really problematic thing for our planet. So you see, like Allison, her genius lives at that intersection of all that she already has, her talent, her skills, her joy, her values. And that's the genius that you have too. And I use the word have with intention because you see, we are born with genius. We aren't born geniuses. Like Mozart wasn't born playing the violin. He wasn't born a composer at birth. He wasn't a musical genius until he became one. What happens is we must learn to use what we have. And that's when we become genius. For example, I am not a genius. I would say that I'm still at the stage of discovering what my genius is and what it could be. Or because this is the Secret Muse Society, I can be even more truthful and say, I'm actually at the stage of accepting what my genius is and valuing it for what it could be. And as I practice using it, as I learn to really own it and hone it, (laughs) own it and hone it, you will see glimpses of my genius. You will experience it as I experience it. But I am not a genius yet, because I have not yet become what I have to be. (laughs) I feel like I'm kind of Yoda right now, but let me say that again. I am not a genius yet, because I have not yet become what I have to be. Because I have not yet become what I have to be. Write it down. It looks different. It hits different. So what's the zone? The zone is when you are becoming what you have. 
You know the movie Soul? It's a Pixar movie. And there is this scene where the main character enters the zone. He's finally getting this chance of a lifetime to play piano with this incredible saxophone jazz player. And it is like his dream come true because he has spent most of his career working towards that, but as a music teacher. And she's doing her thing on the saxophone. He's kind of like unsure of himself at the piano and he starts playing a few notes and then he follows her a little bit more and then he follows her a little bit more and he starts to get into it. And then you can see him kind of stop thinking or he and time kind of stops like the surroundings of the rest of the band. They fade away. It's like time stops and it no longer has meaning. He's not thinking. He's not even really doing. His mind isn't trying to figure out what the next note is or thinking what his finger his, which note his finger should hit next. He's just in the present moment. And these colors are kind of flying and you hear the music going, which to me feels like his senses all wake up. Like all of a sudden he could smell the piano. He can hear different layers of the music. It's more than just the note. It's like a pause, but also the note coming up next or the phrase as a whole, like he's experiencing it all. And this sense of peace takes over. And he flows. He just flows freely. He's just expressing what he has. And it's magical. It's a miracle. And when he comes out of it, everyone's kind of just speechless, including him. He's kind of like, what, wait, what, what just happened there? It's like you enter into a portal and you come out and you're like, huh, where are we now? You have to kind of wait for everything, all the particles of your body to come back together. Isn't that like Star Trek when they transport the body? It's like you transport to that zone and you have to transport back. And like the movie shows, being in the zone is not limited to musicians. Like maybe you enter the zone when you're leading a meeting and all of a sudden an hour has passed and there are so many great ideas on the whiteboard and the people around you feel engaged and you leave feeling pumped about what you're creating together and energized to make it happen. Maybe that's your zone. Or maybe you enter the zone when you're out in the garden with your hands in the dirt. You're sowing the land, planting seeds, pulling weeds, pruning shrubs. And when you stand back to look at what you're growing or what you've cleared, you feel so satisfied. Maybe you're in the zone when you're cooking a meal, chopping the veg, prepping the meat, mixing the sauce, turning up the heat, right? You take pride in serving that food and it's a pleasure to watch people eat it up and you feel so full. Maybe you enter the zone in all three scenarios, or maybe your zones are totally different. And that's okay. That's what makes it genius. And what I really want to point out there is like, genius isn't the big flashy thing that we see in movies. Genius is in those small encounters when we witness a person, when we're in the present. And we're not just talking about when you witness somebody else. When you witness yourself. So that takes us to this next part about defining your zone of genius. If you don't know what your zone of genius is, start by asking yourself those questions about your talent, your skill, your joy, and your values. Get curious about them. Don't say, nah, that's not talented enough. Nah, that's not a skill enough. Nah, that's not joyful enough. Nah, that's not, not that important. Like, you have to go into it with an open mind. Don't judge it. Let it be. Let it be what you already have. Start with where you are. And the next start is start by paying attention when you're in the zone then. Like, when are you feeling awe of somebody else? Or when are you... In a place where like time stops and you've and everything around you just kind of disappears and you're having so much fun. You're like a kid again. 
Or maybe you just start by paying attention to when you notice that you've just come out of the zone, like that feeling of all the particles of your body coming back together. And if you're like me and don't really know what to call all these different zones or how to pinpoint your zone of genius, I'm coming to accept that maybe we don't need to name it. Maybe it doesn't have to be just one thing. Maybe it could be a lot of things. Point is that the zone of genius, believing we have it, is enough to be it. That's what we're going to cover today of the zone of genius. I hope that that is useful for you. I learned about the zone of genius from a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, and you can find that wherever you buy books. But if you want to hear more about the genius zone for me, I'm curious what's on your mind now. Like, are you thinking, well, how do you find the zone? Do you want to talk about that more? How do we live in the zone? Like, how do we get more zone time? Or maybe it's not really rocking your boat, which is fine. We could talk about something else. But what do you want to talk about? I would love to hear from you, Muse. You can reach out to me by email at karen at karenchoy.co. Come and DM me on Instagram. That's where I hang out with the most, Karen. (laughs) Choi.co, <laughs> or hey, I also write this newsletter, which used to be called The Muse in the Middle, but now I've changed it to The Muse Maker. And it's because I wanted to, I realized that I called it The Muse in the Middle. It was kind of playing, was kind of shy and small and not really acknowledging the amazingness of where we are now. And I really feel like the place of my journey right now is to own and hone the genius of being inspired by others, sharing what is inspirational, (laughs) and making more inspiration. That's where I'm at with it right now. Not, I mean, it's not that smooth, but it's true. I would love to hear from you. So please reach out. And if you're curious to look up Alison Palmer, Alison Palmer is the owner and chief curator of Dot and B, which is a pre-loved and vintage clothing company for all people on the planet based in Toronto. You can shop her collection on Instagram at D-O-T-A-N-D-B-E-A. You can find her at local Toronto markets or even schedule a private shopping experience with her genius to witness her genius and she will bring out yours. Allison is the kind of person who makes an entire place light up. She's also a mom. She's also an actor for film and stage. She's also a teacher. Like this lady is just like a quadruple threat. (laughs) And I love her. Thank you, Muse. I hope you were inspired to witness your zone of genius, to let another muse know when you are in the presence of her genius and to pay attention more to this place where I really feel like it honors our authenticity, a spiritual gift. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I'm thinking of you and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the Secret Muse Society. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review this podcast so other modern muses like you can find us too. I invite you to continue the conversation and connect with me on Instagram at karenchoy.co. Join me next week for more secrets inspired by you. I'm Karen Choi. Until next time, stay gold.